um, also to give you some insights from a testing and auditing perspective. And we, we are very confident that you will um, go away with uh, some excellent points that you can weave into your day-to-day -day plans as you approach gluten-free management. For today, our, we have four speakers. Uh, we have Jennifer North, who is uh, with the Beyond Celiac um, organization. We also have Alan Reckonick, who is uh, also with the Allergen Control Group. And then we have uh, two of our own. We have uh, Daniel Thompson, who is with Eurofins uh, Gene Scan. And then last but not least, we have Kimberly Knoll, who is with our Food Safety Systems Group at Eurofins. Um, before we begin, we do have a, a couple of housekeeping points that we'd like to alert you to. So today's webinar is being recorded, and, and so everyone will have the opportunity to receive the recording um, if they like. Uh, this recording will be available within one to two days after the conclusion of today's session. Now, all questions will be answered during a Q&A session at the end of the presentation portion today. Now, any questions that we receive in the queue um, that are not answered um, within the time allotted for today's webinar will be followed up um, by our, our group of panelists today. Now, it, from a mechanical perspective, uh, each of you should have a question, actually should have a question and answer section that's a part of your go-to webinar control panel, um, either at the top of your screen or the right-hand side of your screen. Um, in order to answer the, or actually to enter the questions, all you have to do is to hit the plus sign in that portion of your panel and just go ahead and enter your question. All of your questions uh, from the audience uh, will be entered and we will answer them in the order that they are received. Okay? So without any further ado, I would like to turn the floor over to uh, Jennifer North, who is Vice President of Beyond Celiac. Jennifer, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Can we advance the slide? Beyond Celiac is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 2003 as the National Foundation for Celiac Awareness, and we really had two primary goals. The first, to raise awareness of celiac disease and promote increased diagnosis, and the second, to ensure that gluten-free food would be affordable, accessible, safe, tasty, and understood. And we've worked with many uh, mainstream brands, distributors, and retailers to bring the gluten-free market to fruition over the last almost 15 years. You can advance to the thank you. Um, so you can read our mission statement. I'm not going to read it word for word, but I am going to point out a few highlights, and that is that we promote early diagnosis of celiac disease, effective disease management of celiac disease, which is a serious genetic autoimmune disease, and we also empower our community, engaging them in research to accelerate innovation and essentially forge pathways to a cure for celiac disease, which is actually now in reach. So diagnosis disease management, and research. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, Beyond Celiac has multiple priorities this current year. Uh, we are rebranding celiac disease as a serious genetic autoimmune disease, and we do this by working heavily with our community and amplifying their voices through social media, and also through fairly extensive mass media outreach, and we'll talk about our reach uh, in a few minutes. Uh, we also promote diagnosis by influencing guidelines, raising awareness among at-risk populations, uh, for example, those who are uh, related to people with celiac disease, first and second degree relatives. Um, we advocate for food and drug safety within industry and with regulators, and this is one of the reasons we endorse the gluten-free certification program and proudly put our trademark um, on packaging with uh, brands that have been uh, through facility certification that enables them to uphold the high standards that our organization um, promotes within the food industry. Um, we also advance a research agenda that will essentially accelerate improved quality of life for people with celiac disease. We can advance. 
Um, you'll notice from our reach that we have extensive social media following. We also have a, a fairly extensive website audience and a very extensive uh, resources on our website, including a very um, full section on gluten-free foods. We have resources on reading labels, we have resources on transitioning to the gluten-free diet, and we have lots of ways that we promote brands that uphold the high standards that we believe are necessary to keep our community safe. We can advance. Thank you. When we talk about the market, who is eating gluten-free, um, we like to, to look at this target. In the center of the target are the people who need gluten-free food the most, those with celiac disease. Uh, the prevalence is about 1% of the population. It's about 17% who are currently diagnosed, and we're working really hard to, uh, to drive the diagnosis rate up. We also have people with non-celiac gluten gluten sensitivity. Those are people who have tested negative for celiac disease but still have symptoms when they're exposed to gluten. Um, we're still really understanding non-celiac gluten sensitivity. The research is in its infancy and we're, um, research is trying to understand how much of gluten sensitivity is actually related to the protein gluten and how much of gluten sensitivity may actually be related to other components in wheat. So uh, that research is, is in its infancy. There's no blood test for diagnosing gluten sensitivity. Um, we have other gluten-related disorders, like wheat allergy, for example, um, health, other health concerns, other autoimmune diseases like MS or ADHD, where anecdotally patients are finding symptom relief from the gluten-free diet, although we don't have much evidence to support that, at least not yet. Um, then on the outer ring, we have people who perceive the gluten-free diet to be healthier and cleaner um, or adapted in support of a, a family member who's living gluten-free. So it's not one homogeneous audience. There are many people observing the gluten-free diet, and people with celiac disease and non-gluten sensitivity uh, can't have a crumb of gluten before it sets off an autoimmune reaction. Um, so we'll advance to the next slide. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about why food safety is so important. Um, you can see here a list of the symptoms. There are over 300 signs and symptoms of celiac disease. They are serious. Um, you can have one or some don't have any symptoms at all. So it's very important that people are followed by healthcare providers and that they stick 100% to their strict gluten-free diet to avoid these symptoms and health complications in the future. Um, when we talk about food safety and we talk about the impact that the gluten-free diet has on people with celiac disease, it's interesting to note that once people are diagnosed and often they seek out their own diagnosis, they, they're left to manage celiac disease on their own. So they're left to learn to read food labels, to understand complicated food uh, manufacturing processes, and to understand how to decipher when food is safe for them. And that's why labeling is so important so that we can help get through some of these obstacles in managing the gluten-free diet. And with, uh, with clear labeling, it helps to relieve some of these ongoing concerns. Um, when you look at this, this graph, and I'll translate it for you, these are multiple chronic illnesses across the bottom. You have celiac disease, you have um, diabetes, you have IBS, IBD, and that orange bar in the center is end-stage renal failure. Patients were asked in a, in a research study to rate the, the burden of their treatment. And celiac disease is here on the left, this blue bar on the left. So you'll notice that with patients of all of these chronic illnesses, people with celiac disease actually rate their treatment, which is the gluten-free diet, almost as burdensome as people with end-stage renal disease at how they rate their treatment, which is dialysis. So end-stage renal disease is in the center, and celiac disease other than end-stage renal disease, really does um, exceed all these other chronic illnesses for how difficult it is to manage the treatment. Again, with celiac disease, it's the gluten-free diet. So that's why partnerships with manufacturing is so important to, uh, to, to keep our community able to live their, their lives. Um, when we ask people, how important is the third-party certification in your buying decisions? Um, it's interesting to note that even though we now have an FDA regulation that um, essentially makes the uh, standard for what, a, what has to be on a, on a gluten-free label claim, um, people are still very concerned about cross-contamination in their food, 
about gluten-containing grains and uh, residue entering their food and therefore third-party certification is very important to them. So you'll see that it's, uh, it's over 90% of people with celiac disease that think that third-party certification is very important or somewhat important. Um, they don't trust the gluten-free label. They still have concerns and they do want that third-party validation so that they, they can uh, make it simpler to manage their diet with confidence. When we ask patients what happens when you get glutened, we had 900 responses in, in just a few hours. We have an extensive social media following. And we had no two cases alike. We had lots of, uh, of interesting and very varied symptoms for how devastating gluten exposure can, can be. And here's an example of two, uh, two responses here. Um, we also asked uh, recently, we said to our community, we know how celiac disease affects you when you eat gluten physically, essentially, but what happens when, um, when you get gluten? How does it affect you emotionally? We threw that out to our community. Have you accepted your diagnosis or are you struggling? We had thousands of responses and it's interesting to see that people still do struggle. Um, they talk about crying in supermarkets, they talk about being confused, and they talk about the burden of label reading. So um, what is a very technical decision making at the industry level is very personal to the people who consume gluten-free products. And they, they, quality assurance is what makes people with select disease able to live their lives and, and get through that challenge. This is why we endorse the gluten-free certification program. Um, we do so really for three primary reasons. It aligns our organization, Beyond Celiac, to a rigorous food safety scheme. It enables us to promote best practice standards and to promote the fact that our community does rely on quality control and their needs are serious. Their needs should be taken seriously. Um, we also like to support brands that understand the food safety imperative that's critical to the health of our community. So we like to support through marketing benefits and other recognition the brands that do uphold the true food safety imperative from start to finish. Um, and it also provides an easily identifiable seal on pack that makes buying decisions easier for the community so that they don't have to rely on a PhD to navigate the diet and label reading um, to, to essentially uncover hidden gluten that creates anxiety for them and, uh, and, and makes it difficult. So it's, a, it's an easy scheme that provides an on-pack solution and a way to build trust. We do provide benefits, specific benefits, to brands that are affiliated with the gluten-free certification program, and these are some of the ones that, that you can take advantage of. Um, on our website, we have a sponsors and partners page. Our website's beyondcelac.org, and we do list all of the companies that are uh, certified through the gluten-free certification program. Um, we have opportunities for product reviews and social media shout-outs. We also provide special opportunities first for GFCP brands to receive 20% off of paid advertising and sponsorship placements. And we also have special, special features for GFCP brands throughout the year, including in May during Celiac Awareness Month. So we appreciate the um, the shared values that we have with GFCP brands and we do what we can to promote them through all of the vehicles that, that we maintain. So now we'll forward this over to our first polling question. Thank you, Jennifer. I really appreciate the information that you presented. It's a very enlightening um, data um, that you're also presenting from the consumer side, so we really appreciate that. So uh, this is, will be our, our segue into our first polling question. And so uh, you as the audience member will uh, have an opportunity to engage with us. And um, this is the question. What best describes your company's motivation to obtain gluten-free certification? So at this time, we'll go ahead and launch the poll. And we invite all of the audience members uh, to go ahead and Within the next 10 to 15 seconds, just go ahead and share your selections. And then we'll go ahead and um, share the final results with everyone before moving on to our next speaker. Okay. Still seeing some trending on the food safety assurances. So 
we'll go ahead and close the poll here at this moment. Let's go ahead and share the results. So you, the audience, uh, said in terms of what best describes your company's motivation to obtain gluten-free certification. Um, it seems like the, the main reason, 44% of you voted food safety assurances. Um, with the second and third options, they're market-owned branded products and customer requests. So, and I think this is in line with uh, what Jennifer also presented, you know, just really the aligned missions between having food safety and, and having some certification programs by third-party providers and how that can provide assurances even to the consumer side. So once again, Jennifer, I'd like to thank you for the content that, that you provided. And at this point, uh, we'll go ahead and hide the poll and we'll, we'll move on to our next portion. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos. I uh, appreciate it. And Jennifer, wonderful presentation. Thank you very much this morning. And thank you to everyone uh, for attending the webinar this morning on the Gluten-Free Certification Program. It's uh, really appreciated. And uh, I have about uh, nine or ten slides here to go through uh, with you this morning, uh, outlining the Gluten-Free Certification Program, uh, its benefits and requirements, and uh, look forward to, to any follow-up uh, questions that you may have uh, at, at a later time. Um, a number of years ago, uh, our company, the Allergen Control Group, we identified a number of problems in the gluten-free industry that needed to be addressed. Uh, and it needed to be addressed for both, uh, uh, well, industry, of course, as well as for those consumers um, who purchase gluten-free products for a number of reasons. And Jennifer was great to highlight and identify uh, who that market is. Uh, a mixture of those who are required for, for medical reasons, health reasons, or, or lifestyle reasons. And key problems that we identified were, um, in particular, that consumers were confused by gluten-free label claims. Uh, if you walk into a supermarket today and you look at a, a number of gluten-free products, you, you'll probably find four or five or six different gluten-free labels on products. And what's confusing is you don't know if any of those products are third-party certified or if they are a manufacturer that decided to make a self-declaration on that product. So you don't really know what type of food safety program or, or, or um, you know, food safety support that, that particular brand uh, has. In addition, there are government regulations and the definition of, of, uh, of gluten-free, making a gluten-free claim varies as well uh, worldwide. We know that in North America, uh, in uh, the United States and Canada, um, the regulations are very similar, although there are some differences in Canada. Canada tends to have uh, uh, somewhat higher standards, but but overall, in in general, uh, less than 20 parts per million uh, is at the very least what the gluten thresholds are for making a gluten-free claim. Uh, in other countries around the world, uh, that can vary. So, for example, if you were to sell products into Australia or the New Zealand market, uh, the requirement there is less than three parts per million. So your standards would have to be a lot more stringent in terms of making sure your, your products are in fact gluten-free and following those regulations. Um, historically as well, making a gluten-free claim has been what we call a product certification where certification was based mainly or exclusively on testing. So that could be a combination of some ingredient testing, but mainly end product testing. So if you look at end product testing as an only means for certification, you're talking about random results letting you know that your full production run is in fact gluten-free. So we know that there's risk around that because there can be cross-contamination and if you're not testing where that cross-contamination actually resides, you may be releasing product into the market that is in fact contaminated. So the risk of product failure uh, by, by manufacturers as a result of that uh, would, hold, would hold them responsible for that. So there, there is risk to a manufacturer for, for just using end product testing as a means for certification. Um, from a marketing perspective as well, in terms of a message to the, to the general population or to consumers, there's a message being missed out there. Um, and that is that making a gluten-free claim is a food safety claim, uh, unlike others. Um, where currently or historically it's been treated more as a health claim. So it tends to fall more into the organic or non-GMO, even kosher halal type of type of claim. Uh, but we know that making a gluten-free claim is, is, is much more than that because 
gluten-free is, is a health issue uh, more than anything. So it's yeah, so so there's a whole marketing message there for for marketers to to leverage. We we find out there um, uh, in the market. So so what is the solution? So the solution that we identified uh, to the problem was to develop a program uh, to support ingredient suppliers, food and beverage manufacturers. Um, uh, distributors and retailers with uh, with a scientifically proven risk-based management systems approach to making uh, gluten-free claims. So in other words, it's not just relying on end product testing, but but implementing a solid, strong uh, food safety program within your manufacturing practices to ensure that the risk of cross-contamination from either in, incoming ingredients uh, right through to final to final product isn't happening or avoided. And 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 providing standard standardized a set of global re requirements in order to achieve that, and by doing so from a marketing perspective to consumers, uh, it, it'll provide a credible and trustworthy endorsed gluten-free trademark uh, that the public can trust when they're buying gluten-free products. So so what is the gluten-free certification program? So it, it was created to assist industry with a set of standards and policies. So what we essentially wanted to do was help manufacturers uh, avoid or completely eliminate the risk of uh, cross-contamination, gluten cross-contamination at the manufacturing level. So we wanted to take it from a, a reactive approach to, to more of a proactive solution um, that manufacturers can, can implement. Um, some of the key features of the GSCP uh, include that, um, again, it's, it's the globally recognized preventative food safety approaches. The nice thing about our program for those uh, facilities right now that are following FISMA rules is that our program and the requirements fit beautifully within, within uh, FISMA rules. Um, the program itself is designed really to meet and, exclude, uh, and exceed global regulations. Um, and it's non-prescriptive as well, um, which means that it's adaptable to, to any country that where your products are destined to. And it makes it a lot, uh, a lot easier to, to implement within your manufacturing practices. Uh, it also combines very, very well with other third-party food safety programs. So whether your facility has a GFSI program, such as uh, let's uh, uh, SA, uh, SQF or BRC program, you can in fact combine the GFCP audit as, uh, with, with any of those audits. Uh, that also includes if you have a HACCP program, or even if you simply have G GMPs within your manufacturing facility as a standalone, you can implement the gluten-free certification program standards. In terms of the, the the design of our program, um, we are the only accredited gluten-free program uh, that exists. We follow ISO 17021 accredited gluten-free management system standards. So we are accredited by ANSI uh, ASQ National Accreditation Board, um, which uh, oversees our program. Um, and uh, we are truly regarded as the gold standard for, for ensuring gluten-free products, given that we are uh, the only management system approach, tr true management systems approach for gluten-free, uh, and and by implementing our program again, uh, you can have you can implement or or incorporate a trustworthy mark uh, on your uh, products at the point of purchase. So when we talk about management systems, this is a product certification. What what are the differences? Well, as I just mentioned, when we look at product certification, we're talking mostly about uh, an end product. Uh, testing protocol uh, alone, uh, and and we know that there's some challenges with that. We know that testing uh, alone can can lack certain uh, levels of reliability. Um, some tests can have low validity. Um, we know that testing can be expensive as well. So uh, depending on your risk level as a manufacturer, the type of products that you produce, for example, you may be required to test or. Um, uh, conduct a lot of testing, which means that uh, now you're incurring high levels of cost, uh, uh, you know, as a result of the testing. Testing can also be consuming, uh, time consuming as well, so it can, it can delay product production or slow production down. And the risk of product failure and recall as a result of just using testing can be high as well. So those are some of the challenges that a, making a product certification alone uh, can, uh, can have. However, if you incorporate a management system with a strong testing protocol as well, you'll have the best of both worlds and, and ultimately will uh, ensure the highest level of, of, of uh, gluten-free products that you're putting out in the marketplace. So the GFCP management system's requirements, um, we've listed uh, a number of what those are. 
So they include a number of competencies, which when successfully implemented, uh, provides consistent capacity to produce gluten-free products. Um, we also address gluten as a chemical hazard within the gluten-free certification program. So that's important to note as well. So with respect to uh, key requirements, and we won't, won't go through them all here, but it starts truly with the management commitment. So it's about management within an organization, within a manufacturer saying, yes, we want to have the high standard. We want to make sure that we're doing everything correctly. So we are going to um, uh, essentially make sure that we, we've addressed all of these issues within our manufacturing uh, processes. So that includes having a very strong ingredient supplier approval process. Um, making sure that uh, you know you understand um, you know where where you know your potential sources of gluten are, um, uh, having a strong traceability program, uh, conducting internal gluten-free risk assessments, and ultimately having an annual third-party gluten-free audit as well, um, which is which is truly key. The strengths and benefits of the program, the program was developed for both dedicated and non-dedicated manufacturing facilities. So even if you're a non-dedicated facility, so you are producing gluten containing products as well, our standards and policies aid and assist you in making sure that at, at the time of gluten manufacturing that you're eliminating or, or uh, reducing the, the risk of, of cross-contamination. Um, the program also has tremendous amount of operational efficiencies as well. So as mentioned earlier, you can combine our audit with other third-party food safety audits. So it reduces costs, audit costs and, and audit frequency, reduces testing costs as we talked about, reduces the likelihood of, of a recall, which is, which is truly key. Um, ultimately though, our program does expand the potential for new business as well. So if you're a co-manufacturing facility, for example, and you become certified in our program, you can now go out there and market your manufacturing facility as a gluten-free facility, which can attract new business. <clears throat> um, if you are a brand donor manufacturer, then certainly by making a gluten-free declaration in our program, you have that strong uh, marketing uh, message that you can uh, put out there on your brand packaging. Um, and, uh, and for retailers as well. I mean, the retailers can leverage our program, leverage the claim to make a, a strong message uh, for, for consumers at the retail level. <clears throat> and ultimately, the program does truly support corporate social responsibility. Okay, there we go. In terms of additional strengths and benefits of the program as well, we talked about the, the on-pack trademark that are accessible to, to brand owners in the program. So through our relationship with Beyond Celiac, um, as Jennifer talked, talked about earlier, their name uh, is on product packaging, as is the, the name of the Canadian Celiac Association for products destined to the Canadian market. So you see three trademarks on this particular slide. So products destined for sale in the United States, have the endorsement of Beyond Celiac, products destined for sale in Canada, the Canadian Celiac Association, and then products destined to the international market, we have our, our own uh, gluten-free trademark, which, which you see on the bottom there. Um, so these are very strong trademarks that brands can leverage to truly send a strong message to, to those consumers who require gluten-free products um, for, for health reasons, um, that they're buying products that are truly trusted and can be relied upon. In terms of becoming certified in the gluten-free certification program, there are four simple steps. Uh, the first step you would require to apply to our program, you can contact myself or, or any of our uh, agents at our, uh, at our company and we'll provide you with a link to where you can apply to the program. There's a simple uh, um, um, we, we have a questionnaire that you would fill out an answer which will provide us with some general information and from there we can then put together a program license agreement for use of the trademark which you would sign back. There's also an audit that's required for the program. Uh, the audit is conducted by third-party food safety audit companies uh, of which we have 15 approved in, um, to conduct GFCP audits. As mentioned earlier, those audits can, can also be combined. 
once your facility successfully completes a gluten-free certification audit, then your facility will uh, receive a certificate of recognition uh, in our program. And at that point, any product coming out of any gluten-free product coming out of, out of your facility can then use the gluten-free certification trademarks. Uh, in terms of ongoing relationship and support that we have, we offer support to both uh, regulatory and quality assurance teams as well as marketing teams within, within organizations. Um, at the regulatory and, and QA level, we offer GFCP auditor level training to, to staff so that you can truly understand the requirements of the program and, and, and be able to implement it effectively. Uh, customer service training as well. Uh, as well as consulting services to help uh, businesses implement the program and follow the requirements. For marketing teams, you would have access to the Allergen Control Group's knowledge uh, of, glu of the gluten-free market. And that includes uh, understanding the trends, any research and brand strategies that we can lend and provide through our many years of experience. And of course, leverage, uh, you would then leverage the, the gluten-free certification trademarks endorsed by Beyond Celiac and the Canadian Celiac Association Network. In terms of uh, providing you with uh, an overview of our organization, we currently have over 150 brands certified in our program. So this includes uh, well over 3,500 products, about 130 plus facilities that are recognized and certified to date. Uh, that's across uh, 14 certification bodies. We have uh, over 225 trained and approved auditors worldwide as well. So our program is accessible to any, any manufacturer, any business, whether, whether in North America or worldwide. We audit companies and certify companies in, in every product category as well, uh, as you can see here. And currently in terms of our reach, we have uh, facilities audited in, in these countries. I believe it's about 15 countries right now that we, that we audit and have certified uh, facilities, customers. And lastly, I'd just like to show a few. Uh, we're very proud of our customers and proud of our uh, brands uh, that we certify in our program. And we have a number, uh, uh, just a sampling of, of some of who those organizations are up here on, on the screen. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time. And uh, I'll hand it over to Carlos and uh, the next uh, polling question. Alan, thank you so much for that information. Really appreciate the, the depth that, that you went into, especially as regards to some of the cross-functional effects that your program has um, across organizations, not only in quality, but also in marketing, not only in North America, but also globally. So really appreciate what you've presented today for the audience. So, so at this point, um, we are coming up on our second out of three polling questions. And so uh, the next question that, that we'd like for the audience to participate in is, when are you considering gluten-free certification? And so uh, I will go ahead and launch this poll. We'll give the audience about about 15, 15 seconds uh, to go ahead and start engaging with the poll and start giving us some answers and then we'll, we'll go ahead and start sharing, we'll share that progress here in a little bit. Okay. All right. We are getting some good questions uh, also as well through the control panel. So don't wait on, or at least don't feel that you have to wait until the end of the session to the Q&A part to ask your question. Go ahead and ask your question as soon as you know what it is. And that, again, that, that, will just, um, that will just show up in our queue and then we'll, we'll attend to those at the end of the presentations. So at this point, uh, let's go ahead and close our poll. And let's go ahead and share the results with uh, our audience and our panelists. And so right now, it looks like um, we have some good consistency really across. Um, seems like the, the main answer is uh, 12 months. And so when are you considering gluten-free certification? 12 months is, is the most popular answer uh, amongst our audience members, um, with six months being um, there as well as now. And so, and that's great. And so if, if you need the... Uh, need the services and if you need the support now, we have all of our key opinion leaders that are here with you during this webinar 
and, and certainly they will be accessible to you immediately after the webinar is done. So Alan, thank you so much for uh, your information. And at this point, we'll go ahead and segue into uh, our next part, which is going to cover testing. So at this point, I'd like to turn the floor over to uh, Daniel Thompson with uh, Eurofins. Okay, and Dan, I'm going to go ahead and give you control. And the floor is now officially yours. Okay, thank you, Carlos, and uh, thank you to all of you who have joined us today. Uh, the testing portion may be the, the most dry and uninteresting for most of you, so I will try to keep this uh, brief and to the point. Um, let's see here. So let's see if I can get this to cooperate. Could we advance the slide? Sure. Okay, the age-old saying nobody knows knows. Um, situations where allergens, and in this case specifically gluten, uh, cannot be detected by smell or sight. So how do we answer questions about what might be going on in a product or process? Uh, testing is where this comes into play. Okay, why test for allergens? There are a number of things that uh, one can gain from utilizing testing. Um, in an instance where you are potentially producing products that contain gluten as well as gluten-free products, things like clean-out validations may, may come into play. Uh, testing is a good way to demonstrate the effectiveness of your strategy to clean equipment in between products. Additionally, if you have a supplier uh, that is providing you an ingredient for a product that you are making uh, and there are allergen slash gluten statements uh, as part of that process, uh, a great question to ask is, is this ever backed up by testing? Uh, that can eliminate a lot of heartache and nasty surprises down the line. Additionally, uh, if you have a problem uh, in a process or, or product, uh, testing can be a good tool to track down what the source of that problem might be. So in cases, uh, what is the difference between validation and verification? Validation uh, should be the proof that your cleaning strategy works and is effective. Um, Verification uh, is more on the monitoring side, so kind of keeping tabs on what's going on. Uh, for instance, if uh, potentially an employee has gotten complacent or something has changed about uh, uh, your ingredients, uh, verification uh, ongoing will be a good strategy to uh, keep tabs on things. And this can be accomplished with uh, multitude of uh, sampling types, uh, including finished product, swabs, and rinse water. Uh, one thing to mention here is ATP tests, while great at detecting intact cells, do not actually detect the protein, the allergen itself. So uh, that is one thing to, to keep in mind when uh, looking for testing strategies. Uh, it is good to apply a test that actually detects gluten. So when and where. A couple different uh, places where gluten can find its way into products or processes. One is in transportation and storage. Uh, for instance, a rail car, a truck, a silo, places where things are stored and transported. If they are not cleaned effectively in between things, that can be a source of carryover into something that should not have gluten. Additionally, uh, the way the grain trade works in North America, that's not uncommon to see adventitious presence of wheat, rye, barley, in things that uh, do not contain gluten themselves, so that can certainly be an entry point as well. Uh, additionally, shared equipment, again, uh, if you have uh, products that are being produced on shared equipment, but also upstream in situations like milling and spray drying of ingredients, uh, if there are gluten-containing things at some point that aren't removed before switching over, that can also be a source. Uh, additionally, a uh, focus should be the actual contact surfaces where these products touch. That is where that carryover is going to happen. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. Okay, and what sort of testing uh, should we look for? Uh, sorry to be a broken record, but of course ATP, not always uh, 
the most applicable in cases of allergens and in this case gluten. Uh, ELISA uh, stands for enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, actually detects the protein in question, in this case gluten. Um, the R Biofarm Ritascreen R7001 uh, run with cocktail solution as the official R5 Mendez method. This uh, has multiple uh, certifications, including AOAC OMA, which stands for Official Methods of Analysis. This is an additional level of certification showing that the method is uh, quite robust and effective at detecting gluten in a multitude of sample types. Uh, there's also AACCI and Codex Alimentarius certifications for this method. Uh, furthermore, all of the allergens and especially gluten that we run at Eurofins fall under our ISO 17025 accreditation. So, of course, no situation is absolutely perfect. There are some limitations, uh, things to keep in mind. Uh, in situations where you have heat treatment, fermentation, hydrolysis, and extremes in pH, that may pose challenges in effectively detecting gluten. Additionally, uh, sample types with high lipid content, so specifically things like salad dressings, sauces with high fat, so on and so forth, those can also cause issues. Uh, those seem to be more challenging for lateral flow strip type testing, but can also uh, cause issues with the micro oil format. Uh, additionally, uh, the test results that you get are only as good as your sampling plan. So that is something to keep in mind when you're looking at testing is to formulate a good plan so that you're collecting samples that are representative of your process. Uh, furthermore, uh, we at uh, Eurofins are always happy to consult, consult on that front, uh, help you develop a sampling plan that uh, accomplishes the most information with the hopefully minimal number of samples. Uh, we can also do that testing as quickly as same day for you. And that brings us to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank, thank you, Daniel. Really appreciate uh, your help on that and uh, excellent information from the testing perspective and, and also from sampling. So uh, here, I believe this is our last and final polling question uh, of the session. And so we'll go ahead and, and segue into that portion before we end up with our final presenter, which is Kim Knoll. So uh, the polling question for, for this part is, our manufacturing facility is already third party certifi certified in. And we have some schemes there uh, to select. So um, we'll go ahead and uh, launch this poll at this time. We'll go ahead and give the audience about 15 to 20 seconds to go ahead and um, provide their responses, and then we'll go ahead and share what the poll results are. Once again, um, if you haven't already, um, go ahead and, and queue up your questions uh, on the question part of your control panel. Um, really appreciate everybody's attention to this point and, and engaging with us not only through the question and answers, but also with the polls. And so this is excellent information. And um, we will get to the question and answer portion here shortly. So at this point, uh, we'll go ahead and close uh, the poll. And let's go ahead and share the results. And so at this point, it seems like uh, we, have, um, we have definitely some, some acceptance for SQF. Um, also BRC, so 31% for SQF, 25% for BRC. Um, but a good portion of, of our audience members are also saying that they have um, third-party certification according to other schemes. And so um, that's very helpful information, very interesting too. So at this point, um, we'll go ahead and, and this, that will be our, our last poll that we'll conduct for today's session. And we're, we are going to be going into the last, um, last segment of our presentation uh, to be pr presented by uh, Kim Knoll uh, with Eurofin. So Kim, I'm going to go ahead and give you control of the presentation at this point. Okay. And, Thanks, Carla. And the floor is yours. Great. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I have a couple of slides to share with you today. I 
just hope to give you a little bit of insight through the um, audit process. Okay, um, as Alan had previously mentioned, um, the Gluten-Free Certification Program is a management system-based certification. What's great about this program is that it does not rely solely on finished product testing. The program includes um, an on-site assessment of the entire production process, including the sourcing of raw materials, employee training, cleaning procedures, control of cross-contact or cross-contamination from gluten-containing items and more. And if you've ever participated in a food safety audit in the past, I'm sure you're aware of the importance of a competent auditor. This program has requirements in place for an auditor to be qualified in order to conduct these assessments. Auditors are from a third-party certification body, or CB, following ISO accredited guidelines, which means they are independent from the allergen control group. Auditors must be experienced in conducting food safety and quality management system assessment. Um, they need to have a formal education degree um, and um, HACCP training. The auditor must have lead auditor certificate in good standing under VRC, SQF, IFS, or ISO 22000. The auditor must attend the gluten-free certification training course and pass the written examination. And they must work for one of the accredited certification bodies as well. And you can find a list of the approved certification bodies on the Gluten-Free Certification Program's website. And all CDs must be accredited to ISO 17021. The certification process is pretty straightforward. Um, the first step is to um, learn all about the program and the uh, gluten-free uh, certification program's website is an excellent resource for information, and you can even download the actual audit checklist right from that website. Um, there is a training course that is available, and information on this course that can also be found on the site. Um, additional steps include determining the scope of the audit and identifying which products will be included, forming of a team to manage the gluten-free program, uh, you'll need to conduct a hazard analysis, identifying gluten as a chemical risk, identify what controls will need to be in place, and how those controls will be monitored, and at what frequency, what verification activities will, will take place, and finally the validation of those controls. Uh, you'll also need to define corrective actions should something come up out of spec. Gluten management can be incorporated into your allergen control program. However, it is recommended that um, the gluten management be addressed and managed separately as its own program. To move forward with the audit, you'll first want to follow the application process as described earlier by Alan. Um, if you'd like to work with Urethins as your certification body, we would ask that you complete a brief online service request form. This form will ask for basic information about your facility, including address and contact information. And it will also ask for um, some details regarding the size and complexity of your site. Uh, this information helps us verify the proper audit duration. The form will also um, ask for some information about the products that you're making. And this information helps us select an, um, an approved auditor with the appropriate background and experience um, with your type of product. After we receive the completed form, you, would then, you can then expect a pricing proposal for review and signature. And the next step would be to select audit date. Um, this is an announced audit, so you um, will be aware of the, the dates of the audit. And of course, if a pre-assessment or a gap analysis might be beneficial, um, we can certainly provide you with a proposal for those services as well once we receive your completed um, service request form. I would suggest initiating the audit scheduling process um, maybe about two months prior to your ideal audit date. Um, a good lead time can really help the certification body accommodate um, your preferred time frame when scheduling. The gluten-free certification program audit can be performed as a standalone audit um, with a average audit duration of about one and a half days. If we compare the audit with your annual food safety 
audits such as a GSSI benchmark scheme, then we can likely just add an additional half day to that audit duration. Pairing the audits together can increase efficiency, reduce cost, and reduce redundancy. Many of the same elements are reviewed during the during a GSSI recognized scheme um, and in the gluten free certification program audit. So the auditor can actually review both scheme requirements at the same time. And the audit frequency is annual. The audit process includes an in depth review of the, your site's processes, a review of the potential for cost contact, and the controls that are in place. The auditor will talk with various employees to verify proper training and awareness. And of course, there will be a review of written programs and the associated records. Google control, traceability, supplier approval, uh, raw ingredient verification, um, and um, several other programs will be reviewed. Scoring. Um, the audit is not necessarily scored. Um, the requirements are rated as either passed or nonconformance. If the gluten-free audit is paired with another scheme, you will actually receive two separate scores and two separate audit reports. Again, if you're pairing the audits together and if a requirement is common to those audit schemes and the requirement is not met, then the nonconformance is actually issued to both standards. And for the timeline, you can expect to receive a draft of the report at the end of the audit. Corrective actions must be closed within 28 days. The auditor will then submit the final report and a recommendation into the CD, who will conduct a technical review of the report and the corrective action closure. The CD will submit the final report and recommendation to the allergen control group. And shortly thereafter, you'll receive the final report and certificate. Uh, you can then use the trademark, and you'll need to work with the allergen control group uh, for approval on any packaging artwork. And lastly, just some food for thought. Here are the more common nonconformances that are uh, found at the time of the audit. Schedule A, you will be asked to provide this document to your auditor during the audit. Um, it's a uh, control document that you must complete and then have signed and dated by the allergen control group and that needs to be on, on file at the time of the audit. No training records for line workers, management, or other personnel on gluten control. Supplier approval and receiving records not up to date. There may be missing documentation proving that an ingredient has been properly vetted. No evidence evidence of annual validation or documented internal review of your program, and no documented risk assessment on gluten-free ingredients and products. Thank you. No, thank you, Kim. Really appreciate the information, uh, especially um, on the auditing side and, you know, the process and, and all of the details in regards to, you know, what the food manufacturer have to expect on that. So. Thank you very much for that. So once again, I'd like to really thank our speakers. Um, and we are on time. And so uh, we have an additional 15 minutes that we can dedicate to um, question and answers. And so I will go ahead and now uh, go into the question queue. And I, so now the, the panelists, uh, I, I will go ahead and, and ask the questions. And then we can go from there. So here, let me go ahead and we'll start with our first question of the day. Okay, perfect. I really appreciate the audience members. We've got a good, good, healthy queue of questions here and pretty confident we can get through all of them. So, okay. So first question for our panelists. Um, you don't show a liability option for for the presentation, can you discuss liability? So I'm assuming this is liability for, um, I guess, either from the certification side of things or maybe even from the consumer aspect. So um, do any of our panelists uh, would like to uh, take a stab at this? Yeah. 
based on their self declaration. Uh, hi, uh, Alan here. Uh, I mean, in terms of liability, um, it, it's about the regulations talk about making a declaration or a gluten-free declaration on packaging. Um, up until the point that you do that, then you ultimately are liable for making that claim. So really it's about following the regulations and making sure ultimately that any product that is leaving the facility entering into the marketplace is less than 20 parts per million uh, in terms of uh, uh, containing gluten in the product. Uh, out, outside of that, uh, it's about just having proper food safety requirements in place for the management of, 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 of gluten-free manufacturing and ensuring that those thresholds are, uh, are, are followed um, uh, uh, for, for product entering the marketplace. Okay, thank you, Alan. I hope, I hope that answers the question, and if there's any other aspect of that that you'd like to discuss, please uh, go ahead and resubmit me with more specific details, um, and then we'd be happy to answer that. So, Alan, thank you for that. Um, next question that we have here uh, from our audience is, how small business friendly is the certification program? Um, the companies shown on the slide um, appear to be big corporations. As a small business, how can we fit in? Yeah, that's a great question, and I'm glad that was asked. Uh, we, we certify uh, businesses of all sizes. Uh, what's important, ultimately, is that uh, they can meet the requirements of the program, so that being have the proper, you know, being robust enough to have the, uh, you know, uh, the adequate food safety prerequisites in place to satisfy the requirements, uh, the standards and policies of the program, essentially. And of course, there are some costs around becoming certified as well. Uh, the costs are by no means prohibitive, but um, certainly um, as a smaller business, making sure that you can ultimately satisfy those two requirements. And uh, um, whoever asked the question, if you're interested in uh, knowing a little bit more about uh, um, what those costs are, by all means, please contact me and we could, we could have a chat about that. Perfect, Alan. Thank you for that response. It um, uh, seems like I, I we do have a few questions in the queue in regards to costs, and so um, that could be a follow up, I believe, to the webinar. Um, and we, we do have the members of the audience uh, who asked those questions, and so what well, one one question re related to that, Alan, is um, is there different pricing for sole proprietorship businesses in Canada? Well, in terms of, we, we do have standard costs for the program, however, we do, we are quite flexible as well. Um, so, for example, you know, we do have price points for smaller businesses who are entering into the marketplace, uh, different price points for uh, businesses that may have multiple facilities, for example. Um, so, we, we, we kind of look at it and, and address it on a um, business by business perspective to try to sort of understand the big picture. We, we want to work with each customer to make sure that we can help them with their gluten-free strategies and help them get their get their products into the marketplace with, with our trademark. Uh, we find that that's uh, ultimately, uh, ultimately key. However, keeping in mind that in terms of cost, there, there's really two, two costs to the program. There's the direct costs, which are the certification costs or the program license costs that are paid directly to us for trademark use. Then there are also audit costs as well, which I know Kim, Kim um, uh, addressed in her presentation in terms of the, 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 third, uh, the third party costs. So those costs would have to be discussed directly with, with Kim's group in terms of uh, w you know, what the audit costs would be. Thank you, Alan. Really appreciate that. Um, next question that we have in the queue is in regards to recertification. So how does the recertification process compare to other gluten-free certification pro uh, programs that are out in the market? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take that as well. So, I mean, every gluten-free certification program out there, and they're, they're really just a handful, uh, they each have their own or they follow their own standards and requirements. Uh, all others, for the most part, are based on end product testing, as, as we discussed earlier in the presentation today. Some do include some type of, you know, 
hazard analysis requirements in place, but in terms of an all-encompassing program, which ours is, any existing organization that is currently certified in another program, um, we would not recognize that certification, so they would require to go through a complete certification process uh, in our program. Thank you, Alan. Really appreciate that. Um, one question that we had uh, come in through the queue was in relation to resources and website addresses for the gluten-free certification program. So there it is. And uh, we also have some helpful links up there. So we'll just keep this up um, during the remaining portion of the Q&A um, section. So now moving on to our next question here. Um, this actually comes from an, an auditor in the, in the audience. And so the question is, um, hello, I am an auditor for organic food certification, and I would like to be an auditor for the gluten-free certification. Uh, where can I see a list of certification bodies, and who can I contact um, in order to be added to this list? So. Kim, do you want to handle that one? Because uh, any, any auditor would have to uh, be approved through a, a certification body. Sure, yes. Um, I, there, on the gluten-free certification program website, um, you will be able to see a list of the current CBs that are able to conduct these audits. You um, likely want to have some conversation with those certification bodies. And um, there are um, requirements um, from, from the gluten-free certification to conduct the assessment. So um, once you start working with a approved CV, you would also need to um, go through the auditor training and take the exam. And then there are some, uh, a few other competency requirements um, um, that were listed on one of my slides as well. But um, I believe all the information is also on the website. Terrific. Thank you, Kim. Appreciate that. Okay, next question we have in the queue here, and we have about seven minutes left before we conclude today's webinar, but uh, we'll, we'll move on. Um, here, this question comes from the audience. If a company becomes gluten-free certified, is there or are there restrictions that are placed on employees, um, such as a restriction on the food that they bring into the company or clothing that they wear that may contain gluten from their home? And so that, that's a um, good question. Kim, I'll let you address that one as well. That becomes, uh, you know, although it's part of the standards, it, it becomes a, a bit of an auditing question as well, or part of part of the audit scope. Sure, and I'll be happy to follow up with um, that individual um, after the webinar uh, with some more concrete information. Um, I'm not a, a gluten-free auditor, so um, I don't have the expense conducting these audits. But I imagine it would be um, just part of a, a risk assessment. Um, and 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 you know you know the site would need to determine if 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 um, you know the employee lunches or the clothing you know pose a threat. But um, I will certainly reach out to the experts um, on my team and, and provide a, a better answer at a later time. All right. Thank thank you, Kim. Yes, uh, next question. Yep. Ne next question here is. Uh, what is the difference between GFCP and a non-proprietary gluten-free certification accredited at the same time as a HACCP certification? I, I guess I'd, I'd like that question to be <clears throat> clarified a little bit more in terms of what that what that means. Um, the gluten-free sort of ma making a gluten-free claim. Um, is a um, <clears throat> um, uh, sort of, um, it's it's a self declaration. So essentially, um, so essentially, using a, a certification program like the gluten free certification program, it's designed to support any system, any any internal manufacturing process for gluten free that a that a manufacturer would have so it, it's 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 really there to support that process and to ensure that at the end of the day 
they have the steps, uh, processes, procedures, the verification and, and validation processes in place to to ensure that uh, you know they're 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 meeting each requirement or addressing each critical control point within the manufacturing process to ensure that. Uh, there is no risk of cross-contamination happening, and that's from ingredient coming into the facility right through end product, end product testing. And in order to ensure that that's effectively happening, um, having a third party verify is really key. Bring in a third party who's trained, such as a GFCP certified auditor that your fins would have to be able to come in and, and address those uh, and, and address it to make sure that those requirements are in place. But again, having the GFCP in place would, would support support any manufacturer's processes and ensure ultimately that they are uh, me meeting the requirements, uh, the global requirements. Okay, very good. Thank you, Alan. Appreciate the answer. Okay, uh, next question is, and um, maybe uh, I'll pose this to both Jennifer North, you know, from the consumer side, as well as uh, Daniel Thompson. Um, from the testing side, so and I think this is in, re in regards to proteins that are being denatured by the heat process. So, is it denatured protein still allergenic, and can it still cause allergenic reactions? Uh, my understanding uh, with that question is that, to some degree, yes, those denatured proteins can still cause problems. As far as what the conversion rate to intact gluten is, that is a, a matter of debate uh, in general. Um, the thinking is that it takes much more of that denatured protein to elicit the same response. But uh, welcome Jennifer if she has comment on that as well. I'm by no means a technical expert, but I know that there was uh, recent research released, I think, on uh, gluten-free beer, so there's been a little bit of research done on some different processes used to remove the gluten protein, but I know that there's been some concern from the medical community about whether or not um, gluten, gluten fragments, protein fragments, could fall under the, the radar of the tests. So I know that there is a lot of debate about which tests are appropriate for uh, different types of ingredients that have been processed in various ways to remove or to break down the gluten protein. Um, I would definitely defer to a technical expert on, on that. Uh, in addition to that, I, I may want to add as part of the gluten-free certification program that we, we do have a strict policy in terms of being certified in our program. And I guess this is where some of the regulations from country to country vary as well, that within our program, the strict requirement is that um, dilution, as we say, is not a solution. So you cannot knowingly include a gluten-containing ingredient uh, as part of uh, a finished product in, in the manufacturing process, regardless of whether you can dilute the level of gluten out of the product or down below acceptable thresholds. So within our program, it is, it is not allowed. So. Uh, just want to make sure that, that that that's understood because ultimately it's about protecting consumers and you know consumers have you know various uh, sensitivities to to uh, to gluten so um, again it's about not knowingly including a, a gluten as, as an ingredient okay thank you everybody really appreciate that that response um, and it looks like we, we are coming up on possibly our, our last question that we'll be able to fit into today's time. Uh, last question that we are receiving from the audience is, is it possible to have an ATP negative result on a surface and a positive result with an ELISA test? If yes, in which situation? So Dan, this may be a question for you in terms of testing. Uh, I would say yes. There are documented cases of people having scored equipment clean by ATP and still getting hits uh, by ELISA. Okay. Sounds good. All right, so that concludes our question and answer section. Uh, we do have quite a few questions that are still remaining in our queue. 
Uh, we will circulate these uh, with the, our panelist group today, and you should expect a follow-up here within the next 24 to 48 hours to those questions. Um, I'm still seeing a lot of excellent questions here, and really appreciate your participation and your engagement uh, today. So. Okay, so if I can get to the next slide. Okay, okay. there we go. So appreciate um, our speakers. So once again, uh, Jennifer North, Alan Rickenick, Daniel Thompson, and Kimberly Knoll, really appreciate your participation on today's call. I, I feel that the information you presented today was very compelling. Uh, really provided for a well-rounded uh, discussion today. So really appreciate everybody's participation and uh, also your, your leadership um, in your respective areas. So thank you. And to the audience, I uh, would like to also thank you. Thank you for, for being with us, spending some time uh, with our group today. I uh, hope that the information uh, is something that, that you can incorporate into your day-to-day -day management. And, and we, we certainly hope that uh, the information was enlightening. Um, Please be in touch with these uh, subject matter experts. They are key opinion leaders uh, in the marketplace, especially with respect to gluten-free management. We invite you to, to reach out to them. There's their contact information. And to everyone, um, once again, thank you. Appreciate everybody spending some time. And I look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Take care and have a great day. Thank you.